that in Studio B. Now, it's important to know that we spare no expense at our broadcasting enterprise. And today we have Dan Lewis on the camera. Thank hey, Dan. Thank you, Dan. In fact, it's Dan's camera. Thank you very much. And over here we have the famous Howie Worley. There he is. And Howie is a chef. He's a Garmer J chef. He was trained at Hotel 6 out on 441. You may, uh, you may know where that is. Uh, on, a, on a very good day, it's also known as the Breakers. Uh, that would be that five-star hotel up uh, this part. So we're very happy to have Howie here. He's here every day. He's a superior volunteer and a master gardener. So if you have any questions about gardening stuff, ask Howie. Don't ask me because I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, where's Stacy? I don't see Stacy. Well, let me tell you, Stacy's not here, but you will meet her. She's uh, out there someplace. Uh, Stacy is running the Coral Program, and she does a lot of very interesting things here. And uh, without Stacy, uh, we're kind of kind of over the top. I lose track and everything. Work there. Of course, on the front row we have uh, Jeff. Jeff is here. Jeff, terrific gardener, uh, taking our hydroponics class right now, and a uh, huge volunteer. Uh, builds all kinds of stuff. And it's just an uh, amazing benefit to you and Jeff and Paul. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Okay. So today's a, a really, a really important day for us because we're right on the threshold. We're like this launching a number of very, very interesting programs, and part of our story is air, land, and sea. And being able to demonstrate that there is, for sure, for sure, a relationship between the air, the land, and the sea. Let me do this. I'd like everybody to take a breath, a really nice breath, a very deep breath. Would you do that for me, please? Everybody breathe together. There we go. Inhale. Now that's exciting, isn't it? Okay, exhale now. Don't you feel better? Right away you started feeling better. Didn't you? Really? Okay, are you ready for this? Now I want you to do this again, only this time think about it a little bit more and enjoy it a little bit more. And here we go, we're going to breathe in. I look at that and think of the alveoli opening in your lungs instead of the oh my, the oxygen coursing through your brain. Don't feel more alive, stimulated, and ready for a great day here at Elkin Park. Yes? Yes. Yes. Well done. Well, guess what? The first breath, you can thank the trees. You can thank the lawn. You can thank all of that green stuff. The second breath, you have to thank the ocean. The 40% of what we breathe comes from the ocean. And what are we doing in the ocean? We're but we're doing a good job. We're doing a good job of screening it over. I can tell you this. And what we're doing here today is so, so, so important because the story of the ocean is unseen. Out of sight, out of mind. But what Linda is going to talk to you about today is hugely visible. And it's part of that story of regeneration. We can't see the coral on the bottom of the ocean. We can't see the phytoplankton. We can't see the many, many life forms. But we can, in fact, see butterflies. And it's so important to have an understanding of what goes on in the air, the land, and the sea. And Linda is so gifted in this area. We're very, very happy to have her here today. We're very, very happy to have you here as well. And thank you so much. And without any further, unless you'd like some more Let me introduce to you the famous, the one, the only, Linda Gordon.
We all kind of got started at the same time. UFI, the Open Park Garden Club, and we've all worked together in developing gardening skills. Unfortunately, Open Park Garden Club has dissolved, and we have kind of merged with um, the Quality Garden Club in Wilk Manor. So if anybody's interested in joining, let me know. There's brochures up here to join. But as a result of the Open Park Garden Club dissolving, we are gifting John and UFI <laughs> a check from our treasure. Oh, Mar, this is, uh, thank you so, so very much. Thank you. It's a good start, 
and it, it does make a difference. Let's see here if I can do this right now. Okay, stay away from pesticides if at all possible. John and people down here at UFI can give you advice on what to use if there's really a problem with some pests, but like I said, most of them are good pests, or good bugs, and um, nature takes care of things. If you get a bunch of aphids, ladybugs will move in and take over. Um, so there's there's def definitely different different ways of, of uh, coping with bugs and try and stay away from pesticides. This is what I started with in 2007. Um, we've done an extensive re renovation on the house. We had no yard left. We have one pond gam tree. Do I have an arrow that I can use? Yes. Pond gam tree, a Christmas palm, and a split leaf philodendron. That's what I started with. In 2011, Oakland Park Garden Club started up. UFA, uh, UFI was getting started here. And I started going to everything I could, any talk on nature, gardening, the like. And I started planning because I knew I wanted butterflies in my yard. I have never gardened in my life. So how do we attract pollinators? They need four things, food, shelter, water, and a place to graze young. And this is true for butterflies, bees, moths, um, anything that you want to bring into your yard, bats or even pollinators. Um, a lot of our yards are too small for bats. They need to be held the houses way up high with clear pathways into them. But bats are an excellent thing. There is a lot of good things to be said about that. That's almost a whole other topic. And at some point, I hope to get a bee or a bat person down here to talk to us all about them. They eat tons of mosquitoes. Anyway, back to my butterflies. For butterflies, the food part, the butterflies need nectar plants. That's what they, that's their fuel. For their caterpillars, they need host plants. So to bring butterflies into your yard, it's best to get a combination of both. Nectar plants can be almost anything flowering. Um, firebush, fire spike, um, pintas, firebush. Um, I mean, there's hundreds of flowering bushes. They're all good for butterflies and for the bees. But for the cat, for the butterflies to be able to lay their eggs on a plant, it has to be a specific host plant. Um, monarchs, everybody knows about monarchs and queens. They both lay their eggs on milkweed. And there's a variety of different kinds of milkweed. Here at the farm, we've got giant milkweed and regular tropical milkweed. There's also swamp milkweed, um, various different kinds. And you can find them at nurseries around here. But when you're buying a host plant, you want to make very, very sure that that nursery does not use pesticides. Because if you take that plant home and butterflies come and lay their eggs on it and the caterpillars start eating that plant that's been sprayed with pesticides, they're going to die. So it's very, very important not to use pesticides, hopefully in your whole yard, but especially on host plants. Okay, there's the common milkweed that everybody's seen. Sometimes they're, they have red flowers, orange flowers, but they've got the skinny leaves. Now, if you get a monarch butterfly coming and laying eggs on these, they will disappear fast. I mean, you can have six plants, and in a week, they can be nothing but stems if enough butterflies come and lay their eggs. The caterpillars just eat and eat and eat and eat. So I always suggest, if you're going to be bringing this kind of milkweed into your yard, plant it among other things. Plant it among some nectar plants that'll bring the butterflies in for the nectar, and then they have the host plant right next door to lay their eggs on for the caterpillars to eat. This, um, this big plant going way up here is probably 12 feet tall now, and it's extremely large for a giant milkweed. And I should have cut it, cut it back as I went along, and I didn't, and it's way out of hand now. So most of the time, when I see caterpillars up there on the top, I can't reach them. So they're just kind of on their own, and they're, they're free-picking through the 
birds to come in my, into my yard. But um, once in a while, we'll climb a ladder and pull out those caterpillars and put them in a safe cage just to help propagate and not get them all eaten by birds. That is a monarch caterpillar, almost ready to go and cocoon. And that is the flower of the, um, of the giant milkweed. It's, it's more of a succulent kind of plant. It's a lot thicker, the leaves, so it takes them a lot longer to eat one of those than it does the tropical milkweed that I showed you a couple, couple slides ago. So if you're going to be bringing tropical milkweed into your house, or into your yard, I should say, um, try and get one of these growing in your yard too. Get it established. That way, if you've got a bunch of little caterpillars on your milkweed, and it's all leaking up down to the stems, you can move them, they won't hurt you. You can pick them up gently and put them on these leaves and they can finish eating and they don't starve to death. Because if they don't have milkweed, they do starve. If they're not ready to go cocoon, your caterpillars will starve if you don't get something else in there for them to eat and they only eat milkweed. So I always suggest getting the tropical milkweed along with a giant to prevent that. This is something that I've had semi-luck with. Um, it's called a white vine, and it is also in the milkweed family. If you break the vine, it has that milky sap in it. Um, I haven't had a lot of uh, monarchs lay their eggs on it, and it's a, a real runner. It, unless you like vines, I don't strongly suggest this, unless you've got something very specific that can grow up. Um, it just gets it's taken over my backyard. I'm rubbing it out by the handles right now. But it does have a real pretty flower and the, and the monarchs will lay their eggs on it. But I think they prefer the giant or the tropical. This is a monarch caterpillar um, that is ready to cocoon and they always go into J before they cocoon. Um, and it's, it's an amazing process. Sometimes they'll hang in a J for a day before they cocoon. Sometimes they cocoon almost immediately. Um, this is one that has, it, it's a, an amazing process. If you get a safe cage, especially you with kids, even, even making your own safe cage out of, um, and you all can come up here afterwards and look at all my props. But this is a five gallon paint bucket lid with a tomato cage that's been cut down, screening put around it, and a screen on top. And I usually put a brick up here to hold it so it doesn't just blow over. But this is a very simple safe cage. You can put in a, a pot with um, some milkweed in it, in there, and let the caterpillar eat his last meal, and then they go cocoon on the top of the side. Um, but this, this guy right here isn't quite finished cocooning, cocooning, and if you notice up here in the very back here, those are the legs. I don't know how to back this up, but if you can picture the caterpillar and all his little legs hanging in that J, as he turns green from the bottom, those legs go up to the top and get in a little bunch and then just fall off. And you'll find those in the bottom of the page. I might have some legs bottom of my cage here. This is a fancy one. My husband built this for me. To my specs, it's, it's a wonderful safe cage. The butterfly, the caterpillars can't get out. I can put more food in if I want. They've got plenty of screen to um, cocoon on. Um, and the whole thing just lifts off. I always suggest a portable bottom because you will be amazed at how much they cook. The caterpillars just eat and poop, eat and poop. And the whole bottom of my cage is as you can see, I've probably got 10 um, cocoons in there right now. There is a bunch of cocoons on the top of a screen. I've got a new one now. My old one got too rusty. But as you can see there, there's green ones and there's dark ones. Um, the, they turn, when they after the caterpillar cocoons, it usually takes between 7 and 14 days for the butterfly to emerge. The day before they emerge, that cocoon turns, it looks dark, but actually it's transparent. You can actually see the wings 
through the, through the cocoon, and you know that is your signal, get up early the next morning and watch it emerge. They usually come out first thing in the morning. Um, you know, take a cup of coffee and, you know, you start wiggling a little bit, and then pretty soon the bottom splits open. Let me see if I can. That is that, is that same picture maybe two hours later after some of the cap, um, cocoons have opened and the butterflies are drying their wings. This is one. Oh, I hope I can make this work. Uh, I don't know how to make these videos play. If I tap it, it goes to the next screen. Uh, huh? I don't know how to back up either. Previous. And now what? Now go forward. Anyway, back to milkweed. The 
other butterfly, and unfortunately I haven't seen any queens around in years. Have you, Jesse? You've been seeing queens in your yard? Yeah. Um, and I don't know what the secret is. I don't know why I'm not seeing any in my yard anymore. Anybody else have no queen in their yard and getting monarchs but no queens? You don't get any queens either. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, the queen butterfly also does, does um, milkweed for its host plant. And this is the, cat the caterpillar of the, of the queen. And if you can see, um, this picture isn't the best, but there's one set of antenna up here, another set here, and then another set at the other end. Whereas the monarch caterpillar only has the two sets of antennas. And the striping's a little bit different too, so you can always see the difference when you've got the caterpillars. The cocoons look almost identical. I don't know of any difference. But um, you can get both on your milkweed. There's also a soldier butterfly, and I have never seen those in our area, so I strictly keep my hawks into stuff that I have been able to attract to my yard. And if I can attract them to my yard, you guys can too. Um, this is something else I added to my yard um, very early on when I started landscaping, was the trellis. And trellises are excellent for vines. There are a couple different post vines that you want to concentrate on if you want to bring butterflies into your yard. Um, the vine down here at this end is called the Dutchman's Pipe. And this is a flower from the Dutchman's Pipe. They're the coolest looking things. I'm going to pass this around real quick. Um, I've got, there's a different, different Dutchman pipe varieties, and mine has a particularly small flower. I know some of you have Dutchman's pipes, and the flowers get this big. That, that, yes, yeah, it's huge. They are just enormous. Um, the, the butterfly that lays its eggs on the Dutchman's pipe is called the polygamous butterfly. And it's a, it's a swallowtail, but most people know the swallowtails with a little skinny tail hanging down. The polygamous does not have those. They're a dark butterfly with a yellow border and they do not have um, the tails, but they are swallowtail. So they'll lay their eggs on, on the Dutchman's pipe. There's a flower, like I'm passing around, kind of heart-shaped leaves. And if you see right here on the new growth, at the very end of the vine stem, right here, there's a cluster of yellow eggs. And I have watched so many polygamous butterflies land on this vine. It's right outside my living room window. And you can just see them with their tail coming up and depositing eggs. You can see the monarchs do the same thing. They lay their eggs underneath the leaf. They'll land on the leaf and you see that little tail go up and, and lay the egg. So, Monarchs do single eggs all over your plant. The polygamous always lays in a little cluster like this. And when they hatch, they all stay together in the first two instars. Instars are at the developing caterpillar. So they act like a little herd and they totally destroy the end of that vine. And as they get bigger, they finally separate and go up on into the plants and eat it all up. Um, they're kind of a prehistoric looking caterpillar. The monarch of the caterpillars to me look friendly. You know, you're, you're not so afraid to touch them. These guys look scary to me. Thank you. Um, they're kind of a dark brown color and they got orange little spikies all over them. Oh, I lost a picture there. I have, a, a, they get about this big and they look like rubber. Hi, I. Um, this is the polygamous butterfly that has just come out of this cocoon. And as you can see, instead of hanging down like the little monarch cocoons, the polygamous does a sling. Quite a few swallowtails do a sling kind of cocoon, and they are very hard to see amongst the plants. Um, the polygamous usually doesn't go very far from, the, from its host plant. A lot of times you actually see the cocoons in the vine. And I've got one in here that I can show you afterwards. I'm not sure I want to pass it around because it's kind of fragile right now, hanging from its little sling, but it's, you can 
barely see the little silk um, strings holding that sling up. So this is the polydomus uh, butterfly that just came out. Here it is on my hand, and I don't have a good picture of the top of it. It looks totally different from the bottom. From the bottom, it looks more colorful. From the top, it's all dark with just a yellow border around it. So that's another thing when you're identifying your butterflies. Um, a lot of them look totally different from the top and the bottom. And I thank Jessie for this one. She got a good picture of, the, of her polygama. She's got a huge Dutchman spike. You can go over to her house anytime and find eggs, caterpillars, and butterflies. It's huge. Okay, let's go on to another swallowtail. This is the black or eastern swallowtail caterpillar. Um, and it, the host plant for this butterfly is stuff that you'd like to eat too. So it's kind of a mixed bag. If you plant parsley, carrots, dill, fennel, um, any of those in the, in the carrot family, you're likely to get black eastern swallowtails laying their eggs on it. And they will devour your plants. I had a huge parsley plant that must have had 10 eggs on it. They all hatched, they all started eating the plant, and I didn't get any parsley. So I have found out that rue, R-U-E, is also a plant in this family. And I know it's got medicinal value, but um, I don't like the smell of it. I don't like the plant itself. I don't use it for medicine. So I always have root growing so that if I get swallowtail caterpillars on something I do want, like my parsley, I can move it over to a root plant and it can finish eating there and I still get some parsley. But a lot of people, um, in fact my neighbor accused me of, of having all my, all, all my caterpillars eat her, her dill and her parsley and her carrots. And I said, no, my monarch caterpillars did not do that. They only eat milkweed. What you've got is swallowtails, and I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so they do look similar. They have, have similar um, colors on them. But the, the swallowtail caterpillar has a bigger head. It's not so, it's bigger at one end and smaller at the other end. And you can tell. I mean, if it's, if it's eating parsley, it is not a monarch color, uh, caterpillar. It's a swallowtail. Um, there's the sling that it made. Um, that was on a, on a dill plant. Um, and you can't, you probably can't see it on the screen, but there, yes, you can. Right here, you can see the little silken, silken thread holding that up, and it also is anchored at that end. And when it's amongst green leaves, it is very hard to see. When I cut this Dutchman's pipe cocoon out, I cut the whole green stem down, and you could hardly see the cocoon for the leaves, but now the leaves have died, so the cocoon is still green and it shows up a lot better now. That's the black swallowtail um, after it hatched, and you can see the um, colors on it from the side look totally different from the swallowtail from the top. Now this looks a little bit like a polydomus swallowtail, but if you notice back here, at the back wings, it does have a tail. So that's that's your clue for identifying this butterfly versus the polygonus. And it's got some blues on it too. Um, it's hard to see in this picture, but once you start recognizing these things, you know, you can you can tell your butterflies apart. The next thing that I would love to see all of you get in your yard is some sort of passion fly. There's all different kinds if you've ever been out to Butterfly World and walked down their passion vine path. There are, I don't know, probably hundreds of passion vines that, um, I can never remember his name, that out, out there that's done a lot of hybrid, hybridization on, on passion vines. But this is a very common one. It's in my yard. I picked this from my vine this morning. It's an absolutely gorgeous is this safe to pass? <laughs> okay. You can take a sniff. Um, the vine wilts very quickly after you cut it. So I don't usually raise um, the, the caterpillars in my safe cage because it's too hard to keep, give them food. 
the milkweed stays viable for a lot longer, so you can let them eat for a few days before they go to the home. Um, what's that? I know, that's why how he hates me, because he, he's got his caterpillars back here, and he's constantly having to feed them. Um, so I did cut that one this morning, just so you can see how beautiful the flower is. And that vine will literally take over. <laughs> You've got one. Do you see caterpillars on yours? Oh, yeah. Okay. What, what color are your caterpillars? Orange and black. Orange and black. That's the Gulf of Tillery. Um, it's, it's, I find more fertilities on that vine than any other. But zebra longwings will also lay their eggs on passion vine, and Julia butterflies will lay their eggs on passion vine. Now, like I said, there's a lot of different passion vines, and each one of those three butterflies have their favorites. And Julia's favorite is Horton stem passion vine. The patillary, which is the orange one with black spikes, and let me get a couple. That's another passion vine. Now, I have heard, and I need to research this more, that the red flowers have something that is not good for the caterpillars on in it. So I always suggest purple when you're going with passion vines. The red ones are beautiful, but I don't want my caterpillars eating, eating something that's going to poison them. This is um, a different kind of passion vine than the one I'm passing around, and I don't know the kind because it has never flowered. It stays eaten up all the time where it is. Um, this is the zebra long wing um, caterpillar. My vine just went blank. What is your name? Yeah. Jeff. Jeff's caterpillars were orange with the black spikes. That's the Gulf of Tillery. This is the zebra. And as you can see, there's a lot of zebras on here. That they all just lay their eggs all over the place, usually singly, but they're a thing you see. Um, so they end up eating the whole line. This is a, right here, get your attention to this little guy right here. They also hang in a J, those the white caterpillars. And as they start pupating, it starts from the bottom just like a monarch, and it just starts looking milky, and all those egg, or legs start bunching up. See how they are bunching up to the top? And they're all gathering, and then they fall off. And afterwards, after it's finished, going through all its gyrations, it ends up looking like this, with gold flecks on it, bright gold flecks, and it looks like a dead leaf with horns. Um, and you'll find those all over your mind. They don't usually go very far when they when they cocoon either, and that's the zebra long way when it's finished, um, drying its wings. Now, this is a very common butterfly. It's the state butterfly. Um, it's got a very floaty pattern got any kind of um, nectar plants in your yard. How many have you seen these in your, in your yard? Just about everybody that has plants. Very, very common, very floaty. Um, it's one of my favorites to watch just because they don't flip so fast. You get, you get to watch them and enjoy them. This picture here shows, um, you can see the cocoon right up in here between the two butterflies. One of these just emerged female, and the male was hanging on her cocoon, waiting to mate with her as soon as she came out. They don't even, they don't even let their wings drop. They mate immediately. Sometimes you'll see two males hanging on a cocoon and fighting to get to the female. Um, it's, that's just the way the guys are, I guess. <laughs> here, here they are mating again. The third kind of caterpillar, the passion vine, is the Julia. And it, you can see this caterpillar is different. It's, it's got the black spikes like the other two did, but it's got the orange, orangey red head, and it's got the white dashed line down the back. And it's a smaller caterpillar. It doesn't get as big as the zebras and the artilleries. Um, its favorite passion vine is the porky stem. And the porky stem, um, you can buy corgi stem, um, and it also pops up everywhere. Birds are responsible for distributing corgi stem everywhere. It's kind of, um, 
And this is uh, the orange barn sulfur that came out of that cocoon that I had. Beautiful butterflies. They fly very quickly. It's very hard to identify the different ones. Um, but they fly very quickly through your yard. But if you've got Bahama Cassias, Cassia Latas, we've got quite a few out there in the farm, you will definitely see the yellow butterfly, sometimes more white, sometimes more orange, but you'll definitely get those. Um, another type of butterfly that we have very common here, and I know Monica and I, when we walk, there's a place over on 3rd Avenue, around 53rd Court, that used to have, um, the whole meeting was filled with um, Kunti, which is its host plant. And these guys were almost extinct at one time um, because so many of the coaches were destroyed when we started building in Broward. And they have now made a comeback. I think they're off the, um, I think they may even be off the endangered list now um, because we really come back and planted lots. Landscapers use coaches all the time. Thankfully, Oakland Park has used a lot of coaches in its landscaping and, and meetings and stuff. So the Italian cat, um, butterfly, the only plant it will lay its eggs on are coochies and other things in the cycad family that are very rare and you usually don't find around here. So it's mostly the, the coochie plants. And these are the, uh, these are the cocoons. Um, and Monica and I, the other night when we were walking, we could see the Italians all hanging around. That's the caterpillar. They look kind of rubbery too. They've got the little spots and they tend to go in a herd too. The, the tallow lays its eggs in a little clump. They all hatch together and stay together until they get bigger and then they start devouring the whole plant. And that's the, the um, a tallow butterfly. It's only about this big, so it's a lot smaller than most of the butterflies we have. But it's very distinct. You can kind of see how blue it looks here. It's kind of a black blue, but it's got that red abdomen. Um, here you see it nectaring on a sweet almond, and if, if you have a big enough yard to plant kunti for the town of butterflies, one of the things that you can plant with it is a sweet almond, and it is the uh, favorite nectaring plant for the Italians. Now, in the medians, there weren't any sweet almonds around. They were probably nectaring, what was that, a ginkgo? a gumbo gumbo that we saw the um, butterflies all over. So there's a different things that you can get for nectarine, but as long as you've got the pooties, you'll probably end up with these guys. And they are very cool. Okay, so just a little bit of a recap. For my favorite host plants, I want to get milkweed, both the giant and the, the, and the small, for attracting monarchs and queens. Passion vine, lots of different passion vine. Corky stem is very native, will plant itself and regenerate itself with public birds. And you can get Julia's, Gulf Artillery's, and Zebra Longwings on those. And I hope you all know the difference between the three caterpillars. Now. Which, which, which butterfly has a white caterpillar? Anybody? No. The zebra. Zebra longwing has the white caterpillar. The Gulf Artillery has the orange caterpillar, and the Julia has the dark caterpillar with the white dotted line down its back and a red head. Cassias, Bahama Cassia, um, Cassia alata, are for the are for all of the sulfur butterflies. Dutchman's Pipe is host to the Polygonus. That's this weird looking flower, and the rubbery looking caterpillar. They're fun. Um, Kunti is host to the Atala butterflies. Um, one that I did mention, and I cut down on some of my slides so I wouldn't go too far over an hour. Um, the Plumbago, which is purpley blue flowers that you see in landscaping a lot, it's host to a tiny blue butterfly called the Casca Blue. And since the, cat since the butterfly is so little, the caterpillars and eggs are even smaller, and I've never got out my detective magnifying glass to find those and get pictures of them, but um, they are very tiny. But if you've got plumbago, you will definitely get those little blue butterflies, and I also know that they love um, nectarine on the sweet almond. Um, 
wild lime. Now this is another one I don't have in my yard, so I don't have a lot of, um, I have never gotten the pictures of them. But the people that do have wild lime in their yards, you'll get the giant swallowtails. Howie, you said you found one here? Yes. Okay. Yes, I was just, thank you, Jeff. Um, yes, wild lime is one of their favorite host plants, but they also get on some of the other citrus, like Meyer lime. And they are the ugliest caterpillars, aren't they? Well, they look like a bird frog. Yes. Howie, Howie called me the other day, he says, I don't know what this is, but it looks like bird dropping. And that's, it, some of the caterpillars have such good camouflage. They, they have a face of a dinosaur if you get them under a magnifying glass. It's, I wish I had a wild time just to show you the pictures. Um, have you seen their cocoons? Slings? And then the butterfly, they're giant. They're cute. They're the yellow ones? Yeah. So if you want to, how long has your wild time been growing? Years? Yes. Okay. Yeah. When I got a year. Yes, yes. If you plant the host plants, you will get butterflies and you will get the caterpillars that eat the plant. Have you ever heard, have you had problems with them eating too much of your plants? No. no. Once they're established, they can usually handle themselves. The, the little milkweed is probably the most fragile that you can get. Once these vines are established, um, or the giant milkweed, you, you won't have a problem with them eating your whole plant down to nothing. Parsley and dill, that's another another story. They will get eaten totally. That's why I suggest getting a root plant to go along with it so you can put the caterpillars off. Frog fruit or fog fruit, there's different names for it. It's a nice ground cover that um, is host to the white peacock butterflies. And it's also a nectarine flower for different butterflies. So there's a lot of different things you can get and bring to your yard. Some of them are big, some of them are small, some of them are fine. Some of them are just nectarine flowers, but I guarantee you, if you plant the right things, the host flowers and nectarine flowers, you will get butterflies in your yard. Is there anybody here that doesn't have plants in their yard that are attracting butterflies? I only have a blue billion, but my yard is just full of butterflies all the time. Is it? Okay, well that's good. So they're nectaring on something and maybe neighbors around you have, have stuff. Do you notice any certain kind of butterflies? I, I, I don't know the names of them. Okay. But, well, hopefully after seeing some of these you can identify some of them now. Um, Bougainvillea, I believe, is a, is a nectaring plant for some of the butterflies because I see them flying around it, but it is definitely is not a host. So if your yard is open, where you can plant more things, you can get more butterflies coming in and notice their life cycle. You know, you, yes, so my son has a big so I his place, uh -huh. and there's a ring of palms, and the, the zebras will actually reach the mic, and, and, and there's, I have a video in there, and they just, they just they cluster together at night. Yes. That's another unique thing of, of the zebras. Not only do they, do the males mate with a, with a female as soon as she emerges from her cocoon, but one of the other characteristics of the zebra is that they cluster together. And like I said, they're the floating butterflies. So you see that in the evening at dusk, they'll get favorite places like uh, under Eureka Palms, um, where did you, the, um, Loretta has a Dutchman's pipe that's going up into a tree, and the other night she saw a cluster of, of uh, zebra long wings, and they all kind of roost together, and they just hang upside down in a cluster at night. It's really cool when you see that. I've never seen it in my yard, I don't know why. They just have their favorite places. But to be able to walk out to your yard and see all these different things is, is just truly amazing. So if you do have a yard with just, say, Bougainvillea, 
start looking around for other places where you can plant things and bring more nature in. You know, you know they're in the neighborhood because you're seeing the butterflies. Get them into your yard. Give them places to lay their eggs. Um, all these guys need more habitat. Um, as far as nectarine flowers, there's, like I said, it's, it's almost anything that flowers can be a nectarine flower for, for different butterflies. Some of my favorites are um, the blue quarterweed, um, and we, Howie's got plenty of that growing around here. There's a native version that saves, yes, right here with purple flowers. Um, this is not the native type. It can grow high. The native kind is more of a sprawling, but it also has the kind of purpley blue flowers. Uh, this is the milkweed that's growing here. Um, Firebush gets the orange flowers, and I know we've got samples of that around here too. Um, Fertilities love to nectar on, on the, what were you telling me, Teresa? Did you see fertilities on your firebush? No, you see fertilities on your vine and zebras on your firebush. They will all nectar on those different things. Um, fog fruit, uh, hibiscus, lantana, pens and pintas. Let me, anybody know what this is? Spanish, Spanish needle. Most people say it's a weed. I love this plant. If I get a, a, some of these growing amongst some of my some of my plants in my garden, I usually let it go because it's a favorite nectarine flower of, of many of the butterflies that I've talked about and also bees. So if you can, you know, see it in your park to grow a few weeds in your in your garden patch, do it. Um, it all helps. Here's a plumbago with some some flowers on it. Here's the sweet almond when it's blooming. This bush, I wish I had mine was blooming today. I would have cut off the spring for y'all to smell. This is the sweetest smelling bush. And like I said, it's a favorite nectar flower for the um, atala and also um, the blue cassia. You see butterflies on this all the time and bees galore. When it rains, a week later, this thing looks like snow. And I can't talk about pollinators in your yard without mentioning moths. And since I'm such a caterpillar person, people are always asking me, what's this caterpillar? And I know my butterfly caterpillars, especially the ones down here in South Florida. But sometimes people will send me a caterpillar and it's not something I know. So I start looking it up. And I have found some very interesting moths that are in our area. This moth is very unique. Most moths fly at night. This is a day flying moth. You see this out and about. And the picture doesn't show it very well, but at the very base, there's a good picture. The very base of that um, abdomen has a bright, bright red. And it's almost a blue-black moth with white spots. This is the oleander moth. And it is devastating. Um, not only does it eat oleanders to twigs, but it can pick on your desert roads. Um, I think alab alabanda is another. Does anybody have get these caterpillars? They look very much like, oh, sorry. Um, it looks very much like a multitillary caterpillar. It's orange, and, but instead of one black hair coming out of the spots, it's got little tufts, black tufts. And it, um, it what? And it's, it does, the moth caterpillars I leave alone. There are so many moth caterpillars that will really hurt you that that's why I want you to be able to identify butterfly caterpillars and what they're on and they are safe to pick up. Moth caterpillars, many of them aren't, so don't mess with them. Um, I am going to get a moth, moth program together to help identify some of those dangerous ones. Yes. <laughs> Everybody does that. You know, if you don't know what the caterpillar is, call Linda first before you touch it. Um, this is another caterpillar that I raised, and before I touched it, I looked it up, and Google 
black fuzzy caterpillar with red rings and actually found it. And it is the caterpillar with a giant white leopard moth. I found it up in Ocala and I brought it home and when I identified it, they said it ate sunflowers. And I didn't have sunflower, but I had a Mexican sunflower. I said, well, I'll give it a try. So I put it in a bucket with my Mexican sunflower and the darn thing ate for three weeks. And I kept picking sunflower and giving it sunflower and it just kept eating and pooping and eating and pooping. And finally, I walked out and in the bucket one morning, I found this fuzzy stuff and the caterpillar was gone. This is its cocoon. And many of the moth co cocoons that I have come in come to find in my yard and other people's yards are more of a webby kind of thing. Whereas the butterfly cocoons, you know, hang in little capsules or slings. These, the moths, a lot of the moths do a webby cocoon. And if you've had the oleander moth, it's a very webby, black mess up under your knees. Um, very ugly looking stuff. Anyway, I think it took another three weeks before I got my mom. And it is, it literally was this big. And it looks like a giant white leopard, exactly what you'd think of it looking like. And it hung there for a couple days before it finally flew away. I don't know if they take longer to dry. I have no idea. I don't have much experience with moths, but he was definitely beautiful. And when he moved his wings apart, it was like an iridescent blue inside there on the top of his, on the top of his back. Really interesting moth. Here's another moth that I found in my yard. Um, it was sleeping. It was during the daytime, which is typical for moths. A friend of mine pointed this out to me. I would have totally missed it. Just goes to show you that if you walk your yard and really look, you can find stuff. This is what it looked like when his wings were open. It's an I.O. moth. I.O. And uh, no, no, no caterpillar on that one, sorry. Um, it, it has different, moths have different host plants. They're not as specific as a lot of the butterflies. Like I said on the um, oleander moth, it eats oleanders, it eats desert roses, it can eat a lot of different things. The same with the different moths. A lot of people who have vegetable gardens are probably experienced with the tomato hornworms some of those that attack your vegetables. Those are all, all moth caterpillars. And they could be deadly for your vegetable garden. So, you know, you've got to take the good with the bad. Plant extra for them to eat because they all serve a purpose. The moths are definitely a, um, a pollinator just like the butterflies are. This is a cute little guy that I noticed. Um, like I said, you know, if you go out in your yard, you start seeing stuff. Um, where it is? I know some of you might have seen this before if you've been to my yard. This was a birdhouse that I had on my porch as a decoration. And it had a normal sized bird, uh, birdhouse hole that got filled in. And it is, I had no idea what it was. I saw this little green bee going in and out of there, and I researched it, finally identified it as a green orchid bee, and she would go in that hole at night and close it up every night and open it up every morning and go out and fly around. She lived, successive generations of this green orchid bee lived in here for a couple years before it finally went dormant and there was no activity. So I finally took the back of the house off just to see what was in it. And I'm going to pass this around. We kind of got to hold it at a slant. You can see some of the dead green orchid bees. Oops, are you all right? You can see some of the green orchid bees in here that have, have died and their little nest capsules that she would make in there. So many generations lived in here within the two years. And it's been dormant now and I have no idea why. I haven't seen any green orchid bees around in a while. Um, they're, not only are they a bright, bright green, you can pass this, just keep it in the slant so 
so everything doesn't fall out on the floor. They, they are like little helicopters, you know, where some bees are just, you know, like this. This one will actually hover like a little helicopter. And they're very bright green, and they're just, they're, they you really hear them. Um, I mean, you hear all these, but, you know, when you've got that little buzzing bee, you just stop and you look around. These, these are harmless. It's not like they're, they're defending a hive like honeybees do. You know, those are, you know, definitely a little more um, frightening, I, should, I guess I'll say, to, to a lot of people. These solitary bees that live in something like this are, like I said, they're not defending a hive, so they are not as aggressive. If you just stand still and watch them, they'll leave you alone. The other kind of... Um, Okay, here's, here I have a, caught a great picture of this bee going into its, into its hive. There it has the, the um, pollen on its back legs. There he is going into his little, little hole there. All this dark stuff coming out of that hole is called propolis. And that's something that the bees make. And I don't know why it was drooled down so far on this, but in this picture, if you look real closely, you can see the little green orchid bee in its hole. And then down here is another green orchid bee, and he's stealing that propolis. And I sat there and watched and took pictures for a good half hour. That second bee was taking the propolis, getting it all on, on its legs, taking off, and then coming back and grabbing more, taking off. And I watched it for a half hour. I was, I, and that bee inside was defending her territory. And eventually he stopped, and you can see on the front of that birdhouse that um, it stopped short of going in that, in, into the hole and, and, you know, stealing too much. But I thought that was just so fascinating. And at different times in that two years, I actually saw two bees going in into this hole. They're solitary bees. But it was probably like a mother and a daughter, where the mother was still coming and going, and the daughter hatched in the bottom of the bottom of the box, and then she took over the hive when the mother finally died. There we go, another close-up. You can actually see the little bee face defending her territory there. This is another type of um, solitary bee house. Um, this original one um, ended up getting eaten up by termites, so my husband redid one for me and put new, new bamboo in it. And I'll pass this around for you too. Um, we actually, there's actually some of the old um, bamboo things in there, and if you look closely, you'll see where some of those have um, the propolis stuffed in the hole. They lay their egg at the very back of that bamboo thing, fill it up with food and, and stuff, and when that egg hatches, then they eat their way out, and you've got a new mason bee. These are harmless, too. I've never heard of anybody getting stung by mason bees. Um, they're a very solitary bee. They're a little bit bigger, definitely bigger than the green orchid bee. Do you see the holes in there where, the new, where new bees have come out? some of the older bamboos. Anyway, um, if you put these bee houses up, um, I've had people be very successful with them. You can even do decorative ones like this out of salvage materials. There again, we've got the holes in the side and the bees took up residence. After I made this and hung it on my front porch, six of the seven holes were filled in within two weeks. And within another month, they had all opened up again. Now I have since re-drilled these holes. The bottom one on this side, you can still see where the bee came out. You see in there the little hole? So this is another way you can bring bees to your yard and give them something. If you don't want, you know, there's beehives are, you know, a whole other story. And John Caldwell, and also, um, huh? Yes, Dan Lewis are our experts for honeybees. 
I like solitary bees. They're more my speed with my butterflies. But anyway, um, so there's different things, different ways you can bring these different things into your yard and help pro propagate them um, and give them places to live and be decorative at the same time. This is a picture, I, I had to show this. This is the mason bee coming out of a hole on the bird, on the owl. And I couldn't believe it. Look at that little face. Is that amazing? <laughs> so he's a kind of a white or yellow woolly, woolly looking butter, uh, bee, but very cool. And of course, another uh, pollinator in our yards are hummingbirds. And this is the fire spike outside my living room window, and you can see the hummingbird right here in the middle. So the fire spike is also one of my favorite because you not only get the butterflies on it, but you can get the hummingbirds too. So um, I've got some information here. If anybody wants to take a picture of this and look up various things on, online, you can. I can I've got handouts, or I've got um, pictures of all these things so you can get a close-up on your phones if you want to look up anything else. Top nectaring flowers. Um, if anybody has any questions or would like more information on what to do in their particular yard, what you've got now, come talk to me after, after the meeting or um, give me your email address. We'll get together and talk and I can give you some advice on what to plant. I know I'm working with Dan Lewis now. He's, he's a honeybee guy, but he's into, getting into the butterflies now. And he's getting a lot of the good host plants and nectaring plants established in his yard. And I guarantee that a year from now, it's going to be a show place for butterflies. So, any questions? Huh? No? No? What's your favorite? What, do, you, do you have butterflies in your yard? No? Do you want butterflies in your yard? Okay. We'll try and get them. Yes? If I buy milkweed, let's say, living color. Repeat the question. What's the question? Couldn't hear the question. How do you know that your milkweed doesn't have pesticides? pesticides? How do you know the milkweed you buy doesn't have pesticides? Where do the milkweed stand right up there? Yes. I'm going. Um, one of our one of our commissioners, Tim Wannergan, has milkweed all over his yard. He collects the fuzzy stuff, de defuzzes them, and we have got milkweed seeds for everybody here. Um, these were grown without pesticides. These will grow the small, small milkweeds. I'm not sure if they have yellow flowers, orange, or red. They miss those. Okay, Jeff. So you take those home and plant them, and you'll get milkweed, okay? Um, I suggest never buying a host plant from any of the big box stores. You don't know where that stuff comes from. You don't know what it's been sprayed with. Find yourself an organic nursery. Um, I used to recommend Alexander's, but I've heard that they've got a sale sign up and they've been closed. Downtown Fort Lauderdale? Yeah. Chris, Chris Well Farm Market, back behind the habitat. Yes. Yes. And it's a hidden gem in the middle of Fort Lauderdale. Um, Chris Well. It was where, where to. Um, Native, native places to buy native plants without pesticides. And she's saying Chris Well back behind um, Habitat for Humanity. Right off of Broward. Yes, right off of Broward back behind it, yes. The passion flower. Passion flower. Can we purchase that here? I think we do have, do we? Um, I've got one. I've, I've got one. Okay, I've been banished behind my counter. <laughs> I'm trying to hear questions out here. You guys don't have a microphone. Um, we've actually, in my walks with my friend Monica, we found a passion vine that actually has the passion fruit on it. 
And although we haven't gotten a good cash fruit out of it, we are finding some of the um, the fruit with the seeds. So I will distribute these and break these open. If somebody wants to get some passion vine. Now this is a very aggressive vine. You want to plant it somewhere where you've got support for it, a fence. It's all over a six foot wooden fence on, on our walk. And it's got fatillary caterpillars all over it. Um, so they are they are available, yes. Not a butterfly. She's, she's asking, um, her night blooming jasmine has been Ooh. devastated and she wants to know what was eating it. I suspect some kind of moth or other bug. Not a butterfly. Nothing but sticks. Have you ever seen anything crawling on it? Nothing. Try and pay attention. There's got to be something on there eating it. And once we identify book that's eating it, we can identify what it is. Um, like I said, most of the cat most of the butterflies that I've gone over today, the caterpillars I know and they only eat certain things. So I suspect the long in your, in your case. But back to the question on where to find native plants. Um, new turf up on Dixie and Pompano. Um, most of the time, if you ask them specifically, has this been sprayed, they'll tell you. Um, they, they have a tendency to know where their plants come more than like a Home Depot or Lowe's. They have no, you know, don't, don't buy those plants from them. Um, come here, ask for native plants, Chriswell. Um, anybody else know of any native plants, plant places around? The Mango Gardens might have some. Wait, wait, west, yes. You can look it up online. Yes. Durko is here. Jesse Durko, I believe, I believe most of his stuff is no pesticides. And he's got a lot of exotic stuff, too. It's not all native. If you go with more native plants, like some of them that I've talked about, the host plants, you'll have better luck with them. Um, some of them are, are good for nectaring plants, the non-natives. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Anybody? Okay. Um, please come up here and look at some of the stuff. I've got an Itala here, a Monarch, a Zebra Longwing, a, a, an Orchid Bee that, that's yeah, a green Orchid Bee that dies. Um, I've got a Caterpillar in my safe page here. You're welcome to take pictures of this. Um, the one thing I love about this is that the front comes down so I can replace plants. And also, the top comes off. And I've got all my all my cocoons. This is the golf artillery, the rest are all monarchs. Yeah, golf artillery, good job. It's not an easy one to say. Golf artillery, it's an orange caterpillar. Yeah. And I'm going to try and get this. Come on up. Anybody that wants to see anything close up, I'm going to pull out my uh, 